sun and the day of the bride and so we come to think so too you think this is the day of the sun and the day of his bride and we think so too we think so too look forward to how you're going to break that open up how you're going to unfold it so we worship you bridegroom your bride comes to worship you Christ and King, we come to worship you, Bridegroom. We come to worship you, Christ our King. We come to worship you, Bridegroom. The Bride comes to worship you, Christ the King. We don't even know how to address you that way, but you are the Bridegroom, aren't you? So we're going to try it one more time. We come to worship you, bridegroom. The church comes as a bride to worship you, Christ the King. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Christ the Lord. Let's sing it as a bride. We'll sing it to a bridegroom, eh? Oh, come, let us Yes! From a grateful heart, 
Each time we think of you, the praises start. We love you so much, Jesus. Love you so much. This is a good start, isn't it, Father? Each time we think of you, the praises start. We love you so much. Jesus, love you so much. I worship you. Worship you, Father. Father, we just open our mouths and we begin to sing to you as ones that love you dearly. Wipe your feet with my hand. Feel worthy. Worthy are you, the one who laid his life down for the church. Worthy are you, King, who ransomed us. Worthy are you. Worthy are you. Worthy are you. Hebraya rabre shoroba. Sira rabraya raseria. He will have a sin or a bra. She will have a sin. He will have a sin. He will have a sin. He will have a sin. We come with bowls of prayer. We raise it up before your throne, mighty God. You were the Sins of worship, we bring it before you. She brava rebraya serere nai, he broyara fre craya. You are worthy of the incense that we bring. Saints with bowls of incense, saints with bowls of incense, saints with bowls of incense. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. You are worthy. You are worthy of it all, worthy, worthy, worthy. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory.
love how um, people from Asia, from Africa, from North America, from Europe, people from every tribe, every nation gathers, praising and worshiping one Lord, one Savior, in whom we find our identity as one, which cuts through beyond the bloodlines, beyond ethnicity, beyond cultures. And it's beautiful. Declaring who God is. He is the reason why we are gathered today. And so let's sing the song, He Reigns, because He reigns, gathering every tribe, every nation, every son, every daughter into one family. Yeah? It's the song of the redeemed Rising from the African plain Let's sing that again. It's the song of the redeemed. It's the song of the redeemed Rising from the African plain The song of the even Drowning out the Amazon rain The song of Asian believers Filled with God's holy fire it's Every tribe, every tongue, every nation A love song born of a grateful choir It's so all God's children singing glory, glory Children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. Let it rise above the four winds, caught up in the heavenly sound. Let praises echo from the towers of cathedrals to the faithful gathered on the ground. Of all the songs from some were meant to persist Of all the bells rung from a thousand steeples None rings truer than this It's gold God's children God's children singing glory, glory children singing glory glory hallelujah he reigns and so that's children singing glory glory hallelujah he reigns so that's children singing glory glory Go to the beginning. It's all this. Yeah? Okay. And all the powers of darkness tremble at what they just heard. Cause all the powers of darkness can drown out a single word. All the powers of darkness can all that they just heard. Cause all the powers of darkness can drown out a single word. So that's children singing glory. Children singing glory. 
and all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, this bones will sing. Great are you, Lord, and all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, this bones will sing. Great are you, Lord, and all the earth, and all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, this bones will sing. Great are you, Lord, and all the earth, and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry this bones will sing great are you lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour our praise we pour our praise it's your breath in our
praise, Lord. We pour out our worship. We pour out our life to you, O oh God. Just as you pour out your life to us. We pour out our life to you, O oh God. Joshua will linger in your presence. We'll linger in your presence. We'll linger in your presence. There is so much more than this, oh God. There is so much more. Oh, surrender our identity oh God that identity we draw from our work oh God from anything that is of this world oh God we lay it down oh God we lay it down have your way oh God have your way oh God we lay down our identities oh God as a CEO, as a business owner, as an engineer, as an architect, any identity that the world labels us will lay it down tonight because that's not our primary identity. Our identity is as your son and as your daughter. Nobody can strip that away from us, oh God. Our identity as an Indian and as a Canadian as a U.S., it can be stripped away from us. And yet, as a son, as a daughter, none, none who can separate us from the love of Christ. Once we were without a people, once we were without a nation, once we were without a family, you have brought us as one family, united us into full adoption with full inheritance. So Father, we lay down our crowns before you. We lay down our idols before you. We lay down everything. Even the free will that you have given us. The free will that you have given us. Even that free will will lay it down. down on my knees again surrendering all surrendering all here I am for you I 
Because surrender requires humility. Humility requires denying myself and my own importance. You always have intent. You have intents for this evening, tomorrow morning, and tomorrow evening. You always have desire and purpose. Your spirit is here to accomplish it. So Chad and I want to start by taking our hearts and making them clay before you. And Chad and I start doing that so the rest of us can take the lead and follow Holy Spirit. And I'll come once again as clay that can be made on the wheel. It's only words that I can offer, Father. And so I come with words saying, we come with words saying, can you remake everything that needs to be remade? My mind is the hardest thing to lay down, Father. I can give you my heart, but my ways of thinking, ah. So even as they play in the background, Father, could you just begin to work on our hearts right now, saying, do you really want to lay it down so I can take and mess with it? That's what you're asking. Not take and remake it. Take and mess with it. The remaking comes after the messing. Spirit of God, can you converse with each of us across this room? Strangely, Father, you're not asking us to sing another song about humility or surrender. You're asking us to end with that song which says, I am who you say I am. So we'll end with that, Father. We want to give us some of his new names before we leave tomorrow, new names. We want to say things to us that will be hard to believe, hard to become. That's something you want to do. So we'll sing that song and then end, Father, and go into other stuff we have to do. Yeah? Cool, Abba. Ah!
chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am in my father's house. In my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child. father's house in my father's house there's a place for me i'm a child of god yes i am in my father's there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. With your hands lifted, can we declare this together? In my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child. Oh God, yes I am. You may be seated. Amen. Hey, this evening, uh, I'm just so glad that each and every one of you are here. Uh, one of the things that we've discovered over a period of time ministering to people and shepherding God's people is that if we can settle in our hearts, minds, spirit, deep down, that we are sons and daughters of this most high God and that I have a father and I am his son. If that can deeply settle in a person's life, in a person's heart, I believe that most of the issues that you face in life is gone because there is a God kind of a confidence that really really is birthed deep from within us you can face anything and so I believe that as we have gathered together I believe as we have gathered together as churches from different parts of North America I believe that God is going to do something very, very deep within our lives. And sometimes it's not about how the word is preached or it's not about how entertaining this has been. It's not about, hey, whether Jacob actually gave you a profound word or Chad sa said something. It's not about that at all. Because there are certain things that flesh and blood cannot reveal. But your heart needs to be split open by heaven. And a revelation from heaven needs to be dropped down deep within you. And that would change your life forever. Because we are not about rhetorical skills. It's not about how entertaining we are. It's about how deep you are willing to lay yourself down on this altar. And say, God, do this surgery. Sometimes it's painful because he is going to uproot certain things out of us. And he is going to implant certain things within us. I believe that this night is a night of uprooting. This night is a night of, of, of seeding something so heavenly that what grows out of you is indestructible. Is indestructible. And things will change. Amen. Do you believe that? Do you believe that?
Man, if you say, I believe, would you lift up your hands and say, I believe? Because there's going to be some selective surgeries that needs to be taking place this night. That's things that needs to be removed will be removed. Things that needs to be seeded will be seeded. And then things that needs to be watered will be watered. So things that need to be manured will be manured. Things that need to be quickened will be quickened. Things that need to be pruned will be pruned. But whatever he wants to do, let him do. And that's our heart, that's our attitude. And that's why we want to lift our hands and say, God, do what you want, amen? Do what you want. Do what you want. Amen? Um, can we sing one more song? Is that okay? You, you would allow us? Okay. Okay. Uh, but I don't know what song. So... I just remember that we sang it last year. <laughs> you remember it, man. In LA. Yeah. And it's about, uh, it's about, we make room for you. I will make room. Can I will make room? room. No. Uh, can, can you make room? Can you? Yes. Can you? Is it okay? Yes. Guitar? Is that okay? You lay down your guitar to another guitarist. <laughs> it's not a problem for you to need. Okay. I will make room for you. And while you're making room. Yeah. Uh, no offerings. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. Guitar case offering. Okay. That's for a new guitar or no? no. So why do you yeah. But I want you to make room for him. Is that okay? Do you do you have the lyrics of this song? Do you any any chance like any chance to Google it out? Uh, make room. Make room by upper room.
Sit, guys. Hey, so this is Steven, and that's Nicole, and that's Max, and Yad, that's Yadi. They weren't here when we were introducing people from LA, so they're introduced now. Yeah. Do you want to stand up and turn around and just show your faces? There you go. <laughs> you know, someone sent me an email before we were meeting here uh, saying, the pillars that hold up this floor uh, might have a weakness or two. And that sometimes uh, that song might become real, where you break down the walls. And so at some point I thought, okay, I better kind of tell Chad that perhaps not to keep stomping, because it was becoming, it, it had that resonance, and you could feel the whole thing shaking. And I half expected the four rows in between to go through. And so 
My question was, should I save the ones from Acts 29 or LA first? <laughs> so. Hey, so, uh, if you want, if you go to Psalm 45, verse 16, look at it from the message, eh? Psalm 45, verse 16, from the message. Psalm 45, verse 16, from the message. Here's what it says. Set your mind now on sons. And again, just like I say guys and includes guys and girls, when God says sons, it means sons and daughters. Um, set your mind now on sons. Don't dote on father and grandfather. You'll set up your sons as princes all over the earth. Crazy, eh? Set up your, set up, set your mind now on sons and daughters. Don't dote on father and grandfather. You'll set your sons up as princes all over the earth. And so the intent is, uh, you know, the theme that we came up with was the day of sons and the inheritance of the nations. And you can't take the nations unless you become like the son. Because if you look at Psalm 2, 7 and 8, it says, Ask of me and I shall give you the nations as an inheritance. Who's saying it to whom? The father is saying it to the son. He first says, I've set up my son as king. I've set him up as king. I've set him up as lord. Today I have established you. Today is your coronation. And then he goes on to say, now that you've been placed in your rightful place, ask of me and I'll give you the nations. Ask of it, ask of, it of me as your inheritance. And so we'll talk about the inheritance part tomorrow. How do, we, how do we get to inherit the nations? We'll talk about that tomorrow. But today we want to talk about, so what does it take to be a, the, the kind of son God is looking for? What does it take to be a kind of son or daughter God is looking for? And to know what it is to be a son, you must know what the father looks like. And um, I remember going over this ages ago and thought it would be a good place to start. Because if I don't know what my father is like in reality, then I cannot be the son he wants me to be. And if I cannot be the son he wants me to be, he'll go looking elsewhere. Because I'm supposed to be an accurate representation of the father. I know we've heard this before, but here's the truth. If someone came and asked you to show them the father, would you point to yourself? That's the bottom line, eh? If someone asked you, if someone said to you, Diana, can you show us the Father? Will she take you to the scriptures? Will she take you to the pastor? Will she take you to watch a movie about God? Or will she say, why don't you follow me for a week? And if you see me, you would have seen the Father. Or can you say, Derek, that if you do not believe my words, look at the works I do. And if you look at the works I do, you'll know the Father. That's the extreme we have to take it to. Nothing short of that. Not even taking people to scriptures because you become the scriptures. Crazy, eh? It almost sounds sacrilegious to say that. Don't take them to the scriptures. You'll have to take them to the scriptures till you become the word. Where the word becomes flesh. Well, let's start at the simple premise of, are there areas in your life that you are absolutely okay if people imitate it's because they'll be imitating Christ? And some of you have that and some of us don't. So let's look at what the Father is like because so, so if I want to be the kind of son who can inherit what he wants to give me tomorrow, and the first thing I need to realize is my father is always looking for a family. He's not looking for a church. He's not looking for a congregation. He's not looking for members. He's always looking for a family. He started with that. He started with Adam and Eve. And every time things done, didn't work out, he'd always go back to the family. Didn't work out with Adam and Eve, he goes to Noah. What does he do? Starts with Noah and family. When Israel is not working out, what does he threaten? He says, Moses, let me do away with this, these guys. And I can stand a start a brand new family with you. So there's this constant desire in God's heart to start a family. And so one of the first things I need to realize about my father is that he works best when he works in the context of a family. He doesn't work best in the context of a church or in the context of a service. He works best in the context of a family. 
and he can tolerate high degrees of um, uh, mess. He's really not into fine churches. He isn't. Your God is not a high God. In Germany, they have high churches and low churches. There's no such thing with God. He's an informal, non-protocolish God. The only time he uses protocol is when he wants to show us how holy he is. After that, he's a father. And so in our approach, in our worship, in our conversation, in our prayer, if that doesn't happen, then, we, then I would go so far as to say there's something lacking in my relationship with him. Skill, yes, use your skill, but never let your skill become more important than the messiness of family. The moment Mark begins to beat up on Tate because Tate isn't being finesse. He, he's not being refined. Mark loses a son but gains a finesse son, finesse boy. What you want, what God wants is a church that is a family that learns through messes till in some areas it begins to show some, some areas of refinement. But he's really not concerned about it. I'm not talking about worship, I'm talking about every area of life. Your family is messy, which is why we can't walk in any time we want to. We've got to call ahead of time. In India, they just walk in. They tell you two seconds before they knock on the door that we just wanted to know we were passing by and uh, we would like to drop in. And you say, yeah, yeah, feel free to drop in. And then you hear a knock. And you don't realize they call from outside the door. And now you're scurrying and taking stuff and putting it away. My dad was frying fish once and uh, wasn't dressed well and he ran into the washroom with the frying pan and the fish. And now he's stuck in the washroom and he doesn't know how to come out. And he's whispering under his breath saying, come and get the frying fish, frying pan and the fish. Because they appeared before you could even um, prepare, right? So the point is, families are messy. The first thing that God wants is a family. The first thing that God wants is a family. Which means there will be conversations that are troublesome. Which means there will be times when you know the word touchstone that uh, gold is tested on? You take gold and you rub it on the stone to find out if it's really gold. The actual meaning of touchstone is torment. And sometimes in families, you have to have some degree of um, friction so that you know what you have to work with. That's on the side. We let that one go. So the first thing God wants is to raise a family. The second thing is, uh, I don't know if you believe this about God, but the second thing that I need to know about the Father, and I need to be absolutely convinced about, that he is unadulteratedly, intentionally good always. He is unadulteratedly, intentionally good always. Unadulterated, intentional goodness. Unadulterated, intentional goodness. Always. Always. He's constantly looking for opportunities to be good. He's constantly looking for opportunities to do me good. Unadulterated, intentional goodness, 24-7. These are the attributes that a son can best convey to the world. Who conveys a father's attributes best? The son. These are the attributes that I have to convey through my daily living. That the God I serve is unadulteratedly, intentionally, good always always these are old truths that will never die it doesn't matter how long i believe them i still struggle to accept them on a 24 7 basis that he's unadulteratedly intentionally good always our prayers would get so much shorter and would be so not about us if we believe that If I believed that he was unadulterated, intentionally good always, I'd hardly pray for anything for myself. All my prayers would be for others, for other things. I'd never have to pray for myself. Why? Because I have a father who I absolutely believe is unadulterated, intentionally good always. 
It doesn't matter what my circumstances. He's unadulteratedly, intentionally good, always. Why would I even care to pray about myself? These are the things that I must believe about the Father because if I don't believe this about the Father and if it's not a deep-seated truth, I as a son will not be able to convey this attribute to the world. Next one. He disciplines me into obedience and abundance for the first scripture look at hebrew i mean i'll give you scriptures for each one first one psalm 139 you read psalm 139 the first 10 verses and there is no question as to his unadulterated intentional goodness 24 7. i'm looking jacob i'm looking to see when you wake up i'm looking to see when you go back to bed i'm looking to see uh how i can help you at dawn how i can help you at dusk Every time I go somewhere, I think of you. Every time I see something you like, I remember you. Every time I come across something that I know will catch your eye, I pick it up because I want to bring it home and give it to you. It doesn't matter where you go, when you don't like me, when you run away from me, when you hide from you, me, when you despise me, I'm still looking out for your good. This is all I do 24-7. So great are your thoughts towards me, O oh God, that even if I counted the sands of the sea, I wouldn't be able to overcome the fact that you are continuously thinking of me. Psalm 139 is just a psalm of God's nature as one who is unadulteratedly, intentionally good, always. This is who he is. And if I as a son, I'm not able to convey this attribute of my father to the world, then the world will always see him as one that is miserly, that needs to be coaxed before he does good, that is always a scapegoat for everything wrong. You know one of the mistakes God made? I always tell him this. If you had just not told us that you have all power and know everything, we would never blame you for all the things you could have stopped. What's our, what's our biggest complaint? I wish, why couldn't an all-powerful God stop what was about to happen? That's a constant prayer that we pray. But it comes from such a pathetic, weak, miserly, miserable place. Why? Because I do not believe that he's unadulteratedly, intentionally good, always. Always. In the middle of your misery, find it. Unadulteratedly, intentionally good, always. Second, he disciplines me into obedience and abundance. He disciplines me into obedience and abundance. This is my father. This is my father. He disciplines me into obedience and abundance. He doesn't, he doesn't kuchiku me into uh, obedience and abundance. He disciplines me into obedience and abundance. It's not something we like, eh? And his discipline isn't what you imagine it to be. Pruning is always with the word. He brings the word to you as he's bringing it to you right now. Saying, hey, can I prune you first with my word? If you listen to my word, and change your heart. I don't have to do anything else. But he disciplines me with into obedience and abundance. There is no question of anybody entering into uh, perpetual abundance with God unless one is willing to be disciplined. And unfortunately, for, for you and me, his discipline often comes through people. His discipline comes through people. As in the pruning comes through people, the instruction comes through people, the correction comes through people. And when you don't like it, you begin to slander, you begin to talk about it, you begin to push back against it. His discipline comes through people. But he disciplines us into abundance and into obedience. He loves doing that. He's a father. He'll never hurt. And if I'm raising a family, I have to then convey this attribute to the family that I'm raising. And if you will one day raise a family, you'll have to convey this attribute to your family. Because otherwise, it's impossible to enter into obedience and abundance. Third, this is, this is so hard to wrap my head around. He's embarrassingly lavish and extravagant. He's embarrassingly, la he's embarrassingly lavish 
and overwhelmingly kind. He is embarrassingly lavish and overwhelmingly kind. Is that how you really think of the Father? He's embarrassingly lav lavish and overwhelmingly kind. Embarrassingly lavish, overwhelmingly kind. When was the last time you thought of him that way? Or they? I'm not talking about money now. I'm talking about money and a whole lot of other things. Embarrassingly lavish, overwhelmingly kind, 24-7. All these things about him are 24-7. Embarrassingly lavish, overwhelmingly kind. You find that in 2 Samuel 7, 1. The discipline thing you find in Hebrews 12, 10. Embarrassingly lavish, overwhelmingly kind. If I followed you around, is that what I'll find about your God? Fourth. He is my exceeding great reward and shield. Exceeding great reward and shield. My exceeding great reward and shield. My exceeding great reward and shield. Is that your God? You know, Nehemiah refused to take protection from the king because he didn't want people to think that his God is un unable to protect him. Do you know how many prayers we pray asking for protection? Do you know how much of that comes from fear? Children don't. He is my exceeding great reward, which means for everything I do, I'm not looking for a reward, but I'm not, not going to expect rewards either. He's my father. I'm not going looking for rewards. I'm not saying, I've done this, where is my reward? But I'm never surprised that he rewards. He's a father. I often say this when I'm teaching this part, that we often look, it often looks like we're talking about some other God. This doesn't seem to be the God we worship. It seems like another God. My exceeding great reward. He rewards me for everything. He rewards me for a little bit of faith. He rewards me for a little bit of kindness. He rewards me for faithfulness. He's constantly looking for ways to reward me. He's like a father who always looks out for ways to reward his child. It's very natural for him. He's the best father ever. And my shield, my protection. Continuously looking out for my protection. Even when I begin to slip out of his protective covering, he still makes sure that I'm not left abandoned. Next one. Come walk here again, compassion. He has this come walk here again, compassion. Come walk here again, compassion. You never start from a zero with him when you mess up. If you messed up here, he says, come walk here again. And that's the compassion he has. You don't have to start from zero. The amount of, the amount of hardship we put ourselves through, begging, pleading, and worming our way into his goodness, there's so much time wasted on it. When he's saying, hey, this is where you messed up. This is where you start from. Come walk here again, compassion. This is where you left off. Let me start again with you here. Two steps later, you mess up again. This is where you left off. Let me start over again with you from here. All four or five of these things go into work at the same time. Eh? While he's being compassionate, he's also disciplining you into abundance. And he's also showing you unadulterated goodness. They work in tandem. If this is not the God I convey, then what God am I conveying? This is his true nature. Come walk here again, compassion, where you start 
afresh and you are, uh, I mean, Psalm 103, verse 4 or 5, He surrounds me with loving compassion. He ransoms my soul from hell. He surrounds me with loving kindness and compassion. He fills my years with good days so that my youth is renewed like the eagle. We have a chance today and tomorrow for those of us who messed up, those who of us who haven't broken through yet to start right from where you are with a simple thing saying, son, come, come, come walk here again. Compassion is immediate. It's right at the spot. Let's start walking again. You don't start from zero. You don't pay that kind of a price. Next one. He is, uh, when it comes to him, there's the power of his word he will be faithful to as in there's power in his word and he's faithful when you recognize the power that can be released from his word if you believe it the power the, the, there's power in his word every time i believe his word he is faithful to release the power that is locked up in his word it may take a day or it may take two days but this one thing you can be sure of every time that i trust his word there's power that is in the word that will be released because he is faithful every time i trust his word without any ifs and buts without greek and hebrew just simply taking him literally at face value because that is one thing god is He's not a Hebrew God. He's not a Greek God. He's not an Indian God. He's a plain speaking, simple God. There's a simplicity about God. He really didn't want to complicate things. He wanted, he wanted the dumbest of us to understand. Him. Spoke simple Aramaic or English or whatever. And every time I take anything that he's spoken and I say to him, this is what I really think you said. I'm going to agree that this is how you think, this is how you work, this is how you're going to do things. He's so blooming faithful to it. So blooming faithful. This is an attribute of his that must be conveyed to the world. You know what bothers me is the excuses and the theology in the books that are written about why things won't happen. When it comes to the faithfulness of God to his word, your experiences do not count. His truth and his faithfulness counts. Your experiences do not count. Your experience does not define God's faithfulness. Next one. way opening i go with you son that's another attribute of his he never sends me off alone he opens the way and he says hey i want to walk with you on this jacob can you walk with me way opening i go with you son faithfulness where this is something he, he loves doing every day i must free up my schedule every day for him what does freeing up my schedule look like I have a job to go to, I have a wife to take care of, I have two kids to take care of, I've got groceries to buy, I have made commitments to people, I have uh, things to take care of. Having said all that, knowing that you know it, oh God, I just want you to know that if you want me to free up my schedule, I will, because one of your attributes is you like opening the way, and then after opening the way, you like grabbing my hand and saying, come with me, son, I am the way opening God who goes with you. It's an attribute that helps us step into adventure. He is highly aware of the commitments and the work schedules you have. He is highly aware of it. In fact, you have those work schedules and you're earning the bucks you're earning because he created it for you. But he'd love it if I go to him every day and say, but oh God, this week uh, you can change anything you want and if you do, I'll be ready. That's all I'm saying. And then let him, in his wisdom, do what is necessary. Because one of the attributes of God is, hey, 
leave those nets. I know you're helping your dad, but I need you to follow me. It's one of his attributes. He loves demanding obedience. He loves demanding obedience. Why? Because he does not want to train a baby into a five-year-old. He wants to train a baby into an adult who will look like him. That's what he's looking for. You don't want, you don't want to train that Derek's little girl into a five-year-old. What, what point is that? She'll be cute for another five or six years and then what? You, sorry, uh, longer. Every time I say something like this, Iris stares at me. <laughs> Last time I said, look at her, her toothless grin and Iris sent me a text saying, she has teeth. So, so, so he wants to train us into him. And so it is so critical for us if we want to convey the father's attribute to the world that here is a God who loves demanding obedience but the way he does it is way opening I go with you son that is his approach way opening I go with you son I'll open the way for you but I'll go with you one of the things he loves doing is grabbing your hand sometimes a pull sometimes a gentle tug but grabs your hand and then says let's go doesn't matter whether it's showing compassion where you have to start afresh. Doesn't matter whether he's taking you somewhere. I plead with you in the week ahead. Begin every week saying, Father, I really want to get to this place where even though you and I know the things I have committed to, I'll clear everything for you. You know, the strange thing is you would do it for your spouse. If tomorrow your spouse was in trouble, you clear everything for her. Or you should. You would. It's to go and tell him that. He, he doesn't just mess with you like a pastor would. He's wiser. Now you say that to Ed, me, Edwin, and I'd send you to Columbia tomorrow. Next one. This is so cool. One of the things the father loves doing is see what I'm doing. Uh, see what I'm doing closeness. One of, the, one of the things he likes developing between you and him is, hey, Jacob, come see what I'm doing. That's the kind of closeness I want. I want you to see how I make this happen. I want you to see the ingredients I'm using. I want, to, I want you to see the way I'm thinking. See what I'm doing closeness. See what I'm doing closeness. Guys, these things are the nature of God, eh? You know, you've got to learn, learn how to lay two tracks. One is the word of God, one is the nature of God. These tracks run parallel. If you only lay down the word of God track, you may get specialized at the process of doing things, but you will not find out the nature of the Father's heart. It has to be both. The nature of God is, hey Ravi, come close. Let me show you how I'm planning things, what I'm going to do. It's how he operates. It's how any dad operates. That's how Max will treat his child. Come, let me show you what dad does. And does he do it once a month? Does he do it when he has time? Does he do it when he has a holiday? He would want to do it every day. Cats in the Cradle? What's the song about? Of a son who doesn't have time anymore for his father because the father didn't have time for the son when the son was growing up. These are attributes. And these are the very attributes that are not conveyed to the world, guys. All these things I've mentioned are the very things the world does not know about our God because we are not able to convey it. Strange, eh? These are the things that the world does not know. Why would you want Christ to save you if you don't know what you're being who you're being saved towards? 
Why would you want Christ to save you if you don't know who he is saving you towards? Present the Father, salvation becomes easier. How do you resist a father like this? And when you begin to convey this father, and you get to convey it to him in really dire circumstances. Eh? We don't need pleasant circumstances for them. In fact, it's in crisis, in really tough circumstances, that people notice how different you are. Next one. Unstoppable presence. Unstoppable presence. Unstoppable presence. This is one thing that is no longer your choice. Eh? You do not have a choice with regard to his presence. He is always present. The, 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 the beautiful thing is the ability to recognize it instantly. Like now. Now, right here. Right next to you. In you, around you, here. Unstoppable presence. It's not up to you. You, you can't make him go away. You can't distract him. There's nothing you can do about it. Unfortunately, you got saved. Oh, sorry. Fortunately, you got saved. And now there's nothing, now there's nothing you can do about it. He has decided to take up residence. His presence is continuous. The only thing I have to learn how to do is instantly, instantly connect with him. Instantly connect with him. Instantly connect with him. Unstoppable presence. Is this what you convey to people? When they meet me, is that what they get? When they meet me 24-7, are they aware that here is a man who if you talk to him for a while, you will know the presence of God? Or when they meet me, do they see a little bit of that and a whole lot of other stuff? I met people who, when you go up to them, you'll know the presence of God. Why? Because they're constantly aware of it and walking with it. I long to be someone like that. I got these little pockets during a day, 10 minutes here, 15 minutes there. Oh my God, to be like that on a 24 seven basis. These are what sons look like. This is how, if you are to shepherd two people or 20 people, this is what you're supposed to look like. Couple more and then we'll see where we go. Um, the, other thing he, uh, the other thing he loves giving you is uh, blazing purity, blazing purity. He'll give it to you every time you ask and he hopes that you will sustain it by walking with him. He loves giving you blazing purity. One of the things he hates is Christian purity. Christian purity is such a low bar. Such a low bar. Blazing purity is a kind of purity that only happens when you have a desire for the holiness of God. A desire for the holiness of God. I want it because you are like that. I have a friend who, um, who won't shake hands or won't have me uh, pat their back or anything unless I wash my hands first. Why? Because they feel that my hands are sticky and uh, that if I want to shake their hands or if I want to pat their back or give them a hug, go wash your hands first. 
But because I like the friend, I'm willing to go wash my hands first before I shake their hands or give them a hug or anything of that sort. It's not chat, don't worry. <laughs> but, the, but the thing is, do you want something because the other person is like that? That's blazing purity. I hate it when I want holiness because I'm Christian. I hate it when I want to be holy because I'm a pastor. I hate it when I, when, I, when, I, when I want to be holy because it's Sunday. I hate those kinds of holinesses because that, that's religion. That's exactly what religion is. But can I want purity and blazing purity because I want something that he is? And every time I step into that zone, I begin to share with him a commonality that cannot be shared any other way but that. But you and him begin to resonate because the one thing common to him and to you is this beautiful thing called blazing holiness. Blazing holiness is not perfection. Blazing holiness is not sinlessness. Blazing holiness is a deep, deep desire for the holiness of God. For the holiness that your father possesses. You are the root that his right hand has planted. You are the son that he's raising up for himself. Psalm 80. Just imagine what he's saying. You are the root that my right hand has planted. You are the son that I'm raising up for myself. Then, oh God, if that's the case, that's what I'll be. That's what we're talking about here. And if it's two minutes today, then it'll be three minutes tomorrow and four minutes the day after. And 60 minutes will be brilliant. Even if it takes 60 days, that's only two months. The last one for now, I think. Is a laughter filled Jacob enjoying God. A laughter filled Jacob enjoying God. And he, his eyes are full of laughter. That's one part. And the second part, he's a Jacob enjoying God. I mean, you put in your name, I'm fine with that. But just imagine that, eh? His eyes are full of laughter. Oh man, I wish, I wish we as a church would just recognize that bit. Uh, that his eyes are full of laughter. Religion bans laughter, frowns at laughter. And we are religious. Pawan just burst into loud laughter. Just like that, yeah. Yeah. See, if he did that in the middle of a service, that would be highly like disrespectful. Where's your reverence for God and all this stuff? Our God has laughter-filled eyes. His eyes are laughter-filled. You see how far we are from recognizing who he really is. We don't... I mean, it, uh, Max's daughter thinks... Max is laughter filled. I mean, she looks at his face and just bursts out into peals of laughter. So, meant that in the nicest way, though it came out wrong. Yeah. And so, children look up at their dads and they either laugh or they cry based on what their dad's faces look like. Now you can see why we are the way we are. Because when we look at his face, we do not see laughter filled eyes. And then the second part is, he's a Jacob enjoying God. I find it so hard to think like that. The Jacob enjoying God. Because I usually think I'm disappointing him at some level. The Jacob enjoying God. You can put your own names in there, but if you think I'm the model you want to follow, feel free to put my name. Yeah. I wouldn't blame you for it. Yeah. Any questions, guys, before chat comes? Any questions? 
this is the nature of your God. This is the attributes of God that you need to convey. And the question is, are you conveying? Let's start with the broad question. Are you conveying any of them? Are you conveying some of them? Are you conveying them every day? Or do you convey them occasionally? This is what they need to see. This is what we need to show. Day of the sons begins the year, eh? With conveying the attributes of the father. I say to you, start again, eh? Start again. Let me just pray before chat comes. Father, why is it that we can't wrap our heads around you like this? Why are you still an Old Testament God in a New Testament time? As we look at those things we've written down, I just want to pick two, oh God, and practice them between now and tomorrow evening. Just pick two. So, Father, we look at our notes right now, if we've written them down. Or look at our neighbor's notes. And we pick two. Pick two. I'm going to go for the last one for sure about it. Your eyes are full of laughter. You're a Jacob enjoying God. I'll pick another one, Father. I'll pick embarrassingly lavish, overwhelmingly extravagant God. I want to think of you like that in everything, in the way you interact with me. I want to pick those two. I want to practice them 24-7 so that it exudes from me to others and it exudes from you to me and I will be able to receive it. As, what's that line, Father? One inhabits what one thinks. One inhabits what one thinks. I want to think like this so I can inhabit the nature of my Father and then convey this attribute about. These are the two things I'm going to pick. What are those speaking, Holy Spirit? And I practice it today and tomorrow. 24-7, I'm going to think of you like this. It's possible. Spirit of God, you must help us because you're here to reveal Christ who came to reveal the Father so that we become like him. You must help us. I'm asking, please. Gosh, Lord, you're instantly present. You're here. You're pleased. And then God heard them talking and thinking about him. And the book of remembrance was open. They began to write down in that book the things they said about him. These are the things we say about you, Father. These are the things we say about you. These are the things we say about you. So if this is our Father in heaven, then he cannot be accommodated in our religion. I got to break religion. I got to break out of religion. I got to release my mindset out of religion. And that's going to be the most important thing that we got to. This is who your father is. Any religion cannot accommodate this father because the father shattered any limitation that is put. And therefore, this important part of the scriptures that we need to fully embrace Romans chapter 8 verse 14 down to 17 Romans and chapter 8 and verses 14 down to 17 for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God 
The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. It means if you follow a religion, you can't actually accommodate this father that Jacob has presented from the scriptures, that Jacob has presented from his experience, that Jacob is presenting to us and saying, hey, this is who your father is embracing. That means I can't accommodate him. I can't frame him within a religion. And religion called Christianity does not frame it in. So I need to really break free from religion. And process him as a father and I'm a son and I've been adopted why I've been adopted because I was a son to another father who is the father of all lies and I've actually been graciously pulled out of the father of lies and this father has embraced me now you need to embrace this father this father pulled you out of the father of lies and he's embraced you. Now it is time for us to wrap our hands around him and embrace him and hold on to him. Which means you have been adopted. Now come out of your orphaned mentality completely and embrace this father who has embraced you and therefore I got to get rid of this feeling of abandonment anytime I have this feeling of abandonment I need to understand that I'm following religion and I'm not embracing this father the feeling of loneliness I need to understand that I am not embracing this father the feeling of worthlessness I'm not embracing this father the feeling of insecurity, I'm not embracing this father. The feeling of fear, I'm not embracing this father. The feeling of rejection, I'm not embracing this father. The feeling of hopelessness, I'm not embracing this father. The sadness that is occupying our hearts, I'm not embracing this father. The hypersensitivity that I'm going through in my life, I'm not fully embracing this father. The poverty mentality in which I operate, I'm not embracing this father. He has embraced you he has adopted you did you know that one of the most difficult things with regards to adoption is that an adopted child still can live as an orphan even after adoption we have got to give up on this orphan mentality and embrace this father fully which means we need to come out of religion and embrace this father fully and that liberation, Christ wants us to live. No longer slaves, free children of this beautiful, wonderful Father in heaven. Amen. Amen. So what are we going to do about it? How are we going to break this religious mindset that is so very occupying our mind and so one of the things that we got to understand is that while we are adopted by this father we have a bloodline that has been connected to this father and all of the blessings of this bloodline comes but we still have a curse line that we are connected to as human we got to break this curse line as you embrace this father blessings as you don't embrace this father you continue to live that old life your forefathers your forefathers they worship a religion from where curse continues to flow from generation to generation to generation of not embracing this father who is not religion that you that you got to fully understand that 
while you are adopted and embraced by this father while you are not embracing him you are operating out of a curse line that needs to be strangulated at one point of time this line needs to be compressed to the point that, that it does not flow into our lives any further are you listening are you listening because i have a line that continues to flow from my forefathers because there is a father who is a physical father in my life and there is a grandfather who is of my line there's a great grandfather that is of my line and my forefathers and anybody's forefather in all probability did not did not embrace this father in heaven and there was and there is a curse line that continues on because i worship religion and therefore i need to strangle it this line and say nothing of this bloodline that comes from the generation of my forefathers will flow into me but that the only father who is worthy to be called father may blessings flow from that line deep within me and that needs to be settled tonight because there are certain things within your life that is operating not because you are connected to this father but you are actually operating out of the nature that comes from the earthly sinful generational nature that i still continue to operate if my father is all about laughter what do i have to do with sadness and frowning if my father is all about liberation and generosity what is stinginess doing in my life if my father is blazing purity what is the sin that exists that continues to entangle me we need to continue to understand that there are there are two lines that are flowing in my life and i need to strangle it one life one line completely and eliminate it out of my life so that the blessings of this father will continue to flow in and through me and on to my children and on to my children's children and that is what needs to be part and parcel of our life i began to identify just being a particular kind of i i come from a particular region there are certain things that i began to as identify that because i come from this particular region of india this is how my forefathers behaved this is how they treated their wives this is how they were angry this is how their their male chauvinism actually uh, came out this is how egos actually get, kept operating there are cultural issues and there are regional issues there are linguistic issues there are they there are there are generational issues that continue on and on and on and i have to say at one point of time this must stop this is not how i'm going to treat my wife this is not how my anger flares because my father has embraced me now i need to embrace this father i'm no longer a slave i'm a free son i'm a free son this nature must give up and the beauty of the first born jesus needs to emanate out of my life is coming to a place of complete total absolute surrender and saying god these are intentionally checked out of my life these are but which which actually requires for us as we as we gaze upon this beautiful characteristics of who our father is we need to really put ourselves on the other side of the balance this is who your father is and a many many thekel who parson needs to take place every now and then in our life and this is what happened when when the finger of god wrote on that palace walls and daniel had to come and tell many many thekel who parson hey God has weighed you on his scales and he has found you wanting hey here is who your father is this is what your blood line is this is what your nature must be and 
I need to sit down and, and, and analyze and see, hey, how far I am from who I am. How far I have deviated from who I need to be. Here is a generous father, stinginess exists with him. Here is a blazing purity father, corruption exists with him. When I begin to allow his spirit that liberates me to renew me, everyone say renew. Renew. Everyone say renew. And Father, renew me to be like you, to be like you. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. Amen. That, that very nature of God be seen in me. And that's what we desire. That's what we crave for. That's what our life is. That's what our practice is. And I continue to do that. And, and that happens only when you strangle it the other side of the line and say, this is not going to pass on, okay? These are things that are passed on, but this is not going to pass on to my son. This is not going to pass on to my daughters. These are not going to pass on to one more generation because that which needs to stop has to stop. And that which needs to flow only will flow in and through me. Amen. for the nature of Christ the nature of Christ laying ourselves down as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable which is a reasonable service worship and the Spirit of God broods over all of our negativity the greatest challenge of Christianity today and I, I the greatest challenge of Christianity today is that we don't even sit down and think how deviant we are from where God has called us to. We don't even reflect. We don't even reflect. We don't have time to reflect how deviant we are from who we are called to be. We got to sit down and think about. We have been put on the scales of God and are found wanting. And the aspects that are still found wanting in our lives, we need to set it right. Even before we check out of Vancouver tomorrow evening, go into our own homes. And, and I think this Sunday must be different because we have sat down and thought through and said, God, these are the areas of my life that needs to change. That needs to change. This is not the nature of the Father. These are things that need to change. And must change. They will change. Because I can't live like that any longer. If you're living a religious life, you can live. You can continue to live the way you are living and still come and worship God and go back. That's the beauty of religion. You know what? You can still remain the same. And you can still come and lift up your hands and worship Him. Listen to sermons and go back with absolute no change. But that can't happen if we have embraced the father the father has embraced us if we embrace the father change transformation renewal things can't remain the same because you're now internalizing what needs to change and you're allowing the spirit to change and when 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 you fall back you you're not staying there but you you're getting up and saying god no i can't because this is who you are I am in the worship of my father. I'm not in the worship of a religion. I'm a worship of a father. In, in religion, there can be compartmentalization and departmentalization of my whole life. Okay? That's my religious life. This is my life. But God is saying, I've come and collapsed religion completely. And I have embraced you. Would you take your hands and embrace me? Because I have come to change you. I have come to change you. I have come to transform you. So this night is to embrace this father. Which means I can't live any other life. I got to live the life of my father. I got to allow this, this bloodline that comes from my father in heaven 
pass on from generation to generation to generation. Let's do that tonight. Let's stand up and, and ask him, God, I want to embrace you. That's it. I, I want to embrace you. And I want to give an opportunity to th this night. Let's stand up to our feet and, and, and just, just, just tell to this father, yeah. Well, let, let them sit. Okay. Guys, this is religion. I've asked you to stand. Jacob is asking you to sit. So sit. You know, religion is all about standing and sitting. That, that's our entire service. Stand up, sit down. But. <laughs> Stay what Jacob is saying is so true because we want to give a moment before you stand up. We want to give a moment for you to embrace this father. Is that okay? Do you believe that he has embraced you? Amen. To take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken a hold of your life for. That means, hey, you know what? God has taken a hold of Stephen's life. Now he, Stephen is taking a hold of. And in this combination, in this combination, like he's taken a hold. He's taken a hold. You're taking a hold. He's embraced. You're now embracing him. And things begin to change. Amen. Things begin to change. If we embrace him, with every eyes closed or open door, looking up, or, there's absolutely no position, no posture that's more holy than the other. There are religious postures that are more holy than the other. But in here, whatever you want to do, do. You know. Father, I want to start from within your arms. I don't want to pray to get close to you. I want to start within your embrace. So that's our posture. We aren't, we aren't coming apologizing for sins, asking for forgiveness, praying for acceptance, surrendering. We're not doing anything of that sort. We start from within your arms. That is where I will start. All my conversations for the next few minutes will be within your embrace. Why? Because that's what you're asking us to do. You're saying don't waste your time apologizing, asking for forgiveness, working your way into my goodness. Start from within my arms. So that's where we start from, Father. Strange, because you're holding us and then you're saying, you have been weighed and you have been found wanting. How do you do that? How do you say words like that while holding me? And I'll show me, Abba, where you weighed me and found me wanting. And I'll begin to whisper in your ears and I'll wet your shoulder with my tears. There's only one who can change me, and that's you. You've done a marvelous job, and you continue doing it. So wean me, O oh God, wean us. come to trade my ashes for your beauty. I 
anger for compassion. Judgment for the mercy that I receive every day. Blazing purity for ordinary holiness. Honesty for lies, exaggerations, white lies. I was ransomed from the father of lies. I'm held in the embrace of the father of truth. Transparency where there's pretense. Through it, 
My fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child. One more time, you split the seas. You split the seas. You split the seas so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in the perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Oh, oh, oh. In the crushing, in the nana, you are making new wine. In the soil, I surrender. You are making new wine. In the crushing, in the crushing. In the pressing, you, you are making new wine. In the soil, I now surrender. You, you are breaking new ground. So I, so I yield to you and, and to your careful hand. 
When I trust you, I don't need to understand. Make me a vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing. But all you have given me, Jesus, bring you wine out of me. So I yield my, so I yield to you, to your careful hand. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. Once again, so I yield. So I yield to you and I to your faithful hands. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. Make me a vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever. You want me to be. I came here with nothing, but all you have given me. Bring new wine. Jesus, bring new wine. New wine. Out of me. New wine. Remove. Jesus, uproot. bring new wine. Lord, remove and uproot. And everything that needs to be uprooted from me, oh Father. Every form of deception that is in me, take it out of me. Deception. Deception. I pray expose deception. Oh Father, truths of oh Father that I thought and perceived as truths which are not truth, oh Father. Falsehood and lies, oh Father, expose out of me. Yeah. Sometimes I've convinced myself beyond measure of certain narratives of my own life. Yeah. Expose, interject, interrupt, interject, interrupt, shake us out, shake us out of false narratives in our mind of oh, father this this evening i pray of oh, father shake us out of false narratives that we have convinced ourselves of and i pray of oh, father that every form of deception of oh, father that has taken over us I, I pray that you will shake us out of every form of deception shake us out of every form of false narratives shake us out of every lie of oh, father that we have convinced ourselves oh, that it's okay of oh, father i pray you will shake us out of every compromise that we have compromised uh, our lives with the oh, father I pray, Lord God, the substandard uh, life of living, oh Father, this wonderful life that you have given us, but the substandard life that we are now living, I pray, shake us out. Yeah. Shake us out. Shake us out. Shake us out. Every lie that we have sold ourselves to, I pray in Jesus' name of oh Father, take out that lie, take out that deception. Take out that deception. The spirits of deception of oh Father that deceives us, I pray, shake us out. Shake us out. Shake us out. Shake us out. Some of us, oh Father, you're doing some deep work.
Isaiah 5. Tell me, O oh my people, what more could I have done? Why, when I planted you sweet, did you turn so sour and wild? Holy lives I seek of you, there is no other way. How I long to be your father, return to me and stay. You are the choices mine, and the harvest time is near. I come to gather the fruit, please live in holy fear. So tell me, O oh my people, what more could I have done? Why, when I planted you sweet, would you turn sour and wild? I don't know, Father, there's some kind of a warning that you're working in here today. That you're my choicest vine. Come to gather the fruit now. Oh, day. You can be loving and yet you can bring in your discipline so that we walk in abundance and we, we, we pay heed to it, Father. We pay heed to it. Yeah, church? Isaiah 5. My beloved had a vineyard upon a fertile hill. He plowed it, removed the rocks, planted the choicest wine. He cut a wine press and he built a watchtower. And he waited patiently, expecting a harvest. I want to read a passage from Isaiah 6 and then pray into it, starting in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And Father, as we see, as we press in to see you as our Father who loves us and holds us, it's hard to reconcile that with the holiness that you sit enthroned in. Help us to understand, Father. Do a deep work in our hearts. Do a deep work in our hearts where we see your holiness and we're touched by it. Verse 4, And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of the Lord who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the Lord of hosts. And Father, we are a people of unclean lips. We say many things and do many things that aren't out of holiness. Forgive us, Lord, for how we've spoken about each other. Forgive us, Lord, for how we have complained and haven't always chosen to speak out of a place of purity and holiness. 
but thank you that you are a father that holds us in your arms and holds us close. And he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. And so Father, as we press in and we try to understand how you as a loving Father are also so holy and we are so unholy, we want to be used by you. We want to be used by you. We want to walk in all the things you have for us. And so Father, I thank you for this deep work you're doing in our hearts tonight. Father, cleanse us, purify us, set a burning fire in our hearts, Lord, that our heart and our minds would not be on the things of this earth, but our heart and minds would only be on the things of your kingdom, Father, that we would only want the things of your kingdom, that our heart would only desire the things that you desire. And Father, that we would forsake the ways of this world and that we would forsake running after money and status and wealth and positions of power and influence. And we would choose to want you and you only, Lord, that you would be the only thing our hearts desire. And Father, there's so many things competing for our attention and our desires, Lord, forgive us. Forgive us because we don't always get it right. We don't always choose you. We're so distracted. Father, do a deep work in our hearts and cleanse us. We need you, Lord, to be the hands and feet of Christ in our cities and to the nations. We can't do it if you don't purify us. And so purify us, Lord. Thank you that you are good to do that. Amen. Thank you, Abba. Father, because we have this place till nine, we have to begin to wrap the day up, Abba. But, uh, one of the things we want is this awareness of repentance. Can you make me aware as I go for dinner, as I hang out with people, that some of the things I don't want in my life won't come creeping in as I once again let my guard down. One must be able to let his or her guard down and yet be like Jesus, yet be like the Father. So even as we go, Spirit of God, you who are sometimes called the Spirit of Grace and other times called the Spirit that convicts and brings repentance, would you go with us, laugh at our jokes, but make us deeply aware of the need to carry with us tonight into tomorrow some of the things that have happened in our hearts because of you. We want to make it religious, but we want to end with that song which says, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, holy, holy. See? Hey, sing it to him because he's here, eh? Don't sing it to him in heaven. Sing it because he's here, eh? So let's just start again. Become aware of his presence here. We're singing to him right here. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, holy, holy are you. Sing a new song to him who sits on. <laughs> He's here. One more time. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings, 
You are my everything, and I will adore you. Next verse. Clothes in rainbows of living color, flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder. Blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise King. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Filled with wonder, awestruck wonder, at the mention of your name. One more time, filled with wonder. Filled with wonder, awestruck wonder, at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water. Such a marvelous mystery. Jesus, your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath, and living water. Such a marvelous mystery. Holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. the first verse. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty on earth and in early in the evening Oh. 
shall rise to thee. Only thou art holy. Only thou art holy. There is none besides thee. There is none beside. Perfect in power, in love and purity. Perfect in power, in love and purity. Just repeat that verse again, we'll end with it. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. Early in the evening. Early in the evening, a song the child rise to thee. Only thou art holy. Holy thou art holy. There is none. There is none beside thee. Perfect. Perfect in power, in love and purity. We bless you, Abba. Pleasure singing to you. See you tomorrow morning. Though you're not going anywhere. Yeah. Guys, uh, is there any housekeeping stuff? No. 9.30 tomorrow. The, this isn't the place, it's the other place. Um, and then there'll be lunch and it'll be a barbecue kind of lunch. If you are keto, uh, we'll force you to eat meat and stuff like that. So, Chad, be warned. Alrighty, good night. And uh, if you haven't eaten yet, find someone from the church in Vancouver and insist that they take you out for dinner. Yeah? Tomorrow, if you're, if you're driving, uh, make sure you park uh, two rows away from the front because that's where we'll be barbecuing. So just be aware of that. <laughs>